New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap. Good morning. New York Times bestselling author David O. Stewart. <laughs> I'm going to run down the litany of authors in the room. Oh, great to be here. And uh, Jefferson County prosecuting attorney Matt Harvey. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. Good to hear. You're not here next week. I'm not here. No, I'll be in southern West Virginia. And uh, John, you're not here next week. I'll be in southern Texas. And, and David, you're not here next week. Uh, I, I don't belong here. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that same way sometimes. Yeah. All right. Uh, it's, it's author introduction time. I'm going to turn this one over again to Mr. Gilstrap. We have the honor of having Dan Moldea, Dan E. Moldea, um, with us. He's one of my favorite people in the world and one of the most interesting people to talk to. It's teeing it up for you there, Dan. Um, he's an American best-selling author and investigative journalist. He's reported on organized crime and political corruption since 1974. He's the author of books about the rise and fall of Jimmy Hoffa, the contract killing of an Ohio businessman, the mafia's penetration of Hollywood. What? And it's links to Ronald Reagan. It's influenced professional football as well as works about the assassination of Senator Robert Kennedy and o in the O.J. Simpson murder case and a bunch of other stuff. Dan is one of these guys. I, I love to spend time with him. And he is it fair to say, Dan, that you you have an instinctive drive to stir stuff? I'm a relentless soul, John. <laughs> um, and most of our most of our our, our our dealings have been at a poker table when you've been busy uh, winning my money uh, uh, with great honesty and integrity. So I, 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 I'm remembering the also David Stewart, one of my favorite people. Hello, David there. And okay. I'm happy to meet Rob and Matt as well. Well, you know, I don't mind being a consolation prize with these two guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay with me. Dan, this well, is you're a... with there. You're with a couple of legends there oh. in the studio. Well, I know David, I know David and, is. And, and John. Hey, I, this is of particular interest to me because uh, I am Sicilian and my father was a teamster. So uh, I was old enough to remember when, Hoss, when Hoffa didn't re, uh, return, uh, basically. And I am also a uh, history buff on the Kennedy assassination. Uh, in the 90s, I spent a great part of that decade reading everything I could and interviewing people regarding the Kennedy assassination and that it wasn't just a straight Lee Harvey Oswald decision one day to kill the president. There was a lot more involved. So this is a fascinating topic to me, sir. Well, can, can I just say something there, Rob? Yes. Um, you know who Alan Dulles is. He was the mm -hmm. director of the Central Intelligence Agency. And after he was fired by President Kennedy in the aftermath of the failure of the Bay of Biggs invasion in April of 1961, um, he wound up on the Warren Commission, which, as you know, was the big investigation of the JFK murder. And I believe that, and I'm sure you're going to agree with me, that if Alan Dulles had said to his colleagues on the Warren Commission, listen, guys, um, I should probably tell you that when I was director of the CIA, we were working in concert with the mafia to kill Fidel Castro. I can't believe that that information wouldn't have created a whole new avenue of investigation uh, for, the, for the Warren Commission, particularly in light of the mob connections of Lee Harvey Oswald and, and, and Jack Ruby. I had, in, in my 1978 book, The Hoffa Wars, I was the first person to make, uh, state the case that Jimmy Hoffa, the president of the Teamsters Union, Carlos Marcello, the mafia boss of New Orleans, and Santo Traficani, the mafia boss of Tampa, Florida, had arranged and executed, had engineered the murder of the president in 1963. And then shortly after my book was released, the U.S. House Select Committee on Assassinations, which was the only the second uh, a government group to investigate the murder, uh, began its public hearings and investigation. And when they released their final report in July 1979, a year after my book came out, they concluded that Hoffa, Marcello, and Traficani had arranged and executed, ha had the motive, means, and opportunity to kill the president and the chief counsel of the committee, G. Robert Blakey, the world's expert on the mafia, the man who wrote the RICO legislation for the Department of Justice in 1970. He declared in no uncertain terms as chief counsel of the committee, the mob did it. It's a historical fact. So that's where I'm at. I believe that then, and I believe that now. And we have admissions from Frank Regano. Who Frank was, was a friend of mine. Mob yeah. attorney, right? And yeah. uh, in, the, uh, in the Joe Bonanno and uh, his son Salvatore Bill Bonanno's books, they both in the book 
uh, if I recall correctly, if at least one of them made mention of the fact that it was a mob hit. Uh, well, Regano went into some detail about that. I was among the first people he told that to. Uh, Frank, when I, was, when I came out with the Hoff Wars in 78, Frank offered me a quarter million dollars. He wanted all the rights to the book. And I didn't know whether he wanted to exploit it for some reason or whether he wanted to kill him. And the right-hand man to Bobby Kennedy at the Department of Justice, and in fact when, he was, when Bobby Kennedy was at the Senate Rackets Committee, was Walter Sheridan. Walter Sheridan was a great man. He was my mentor especially during my Hoff investigations. He was the head of the Get Hoffa squad. It was as a result of Walter Sheridan's work that Jimmy Hoffa was convicted of jury tampering in 1964. Then later that year, he was convicted of pension fraud in Chicago. Um, Bobby Kennedy was the greatest crime fighter we, we've ever had. Uh, he, was, he was eating mafia guys for breakfast when he was chief counsel of the Senate Rackets Committee. And when he became attorney general of the United States under his brother in 1961, he started eating mafia guys for lunch and dinner, too. Greatest crime fighter we've ever had. And my investigation of his murder showed that Sirhan Sirhan did it and did it alone. I spent a lot of time with Sirhan. I did three interviews with him for about 14 hours. There is no doubt in the world about that, despite what... Senator Kennedy's idiot son, Robert Kennedy Jr., is believing right now that Sirhan Sirhan is an innocent man wrongly accused, which is ridiculous. So, Dan, what was – first of all, I was remiss. I want to plug your book, Confessions of a Guerrilla Writer. It's, it's a beast of a book. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long book, but it reads like lightning. It's really – it's a fascinating – Kind of an author's memoir, I guess, for lack of a better term. That exactly gets, what it is. Thank you. Yes. Gets into the details of some of these things. Tell us about the motivation. Why did the mafia want to kill JFK? Because Bobby Kennedy was relentless in his pursuit of the mafia. The, there was a big month in September 1962 where Jimmy Hoffa had a meeting with um, uh, Ed Parton. Ed Parton was the uh, was he was a top officer in the Baton Rouge local, and he was a trusted um, associate of Hoffa, and they were talking about Bobby Kennedy. And Hoffa asked Parton whether he could get plastic explosives because he wanted to blow up the Kennedy home at Hickory Hill, Virginia, just off 123 here in, in, in near Washington, and um, and he wanted to kill. Not just Bob Kennedy. He wanted to kill Ethel. He wanted to kill all the children. And, and so he was in a position where he knew what Hoffa was doing. And it was Ed Partons whose testimony convicted Hoffa of jury tampering in Chattanooga in 1964. Um, that same month in September of 1962, after Ed Parton flipped and turned state's evidence against Hoffa, um, and then later came out and testified in 64, spending two years behind the curtains. Uh, Carlos Marcello was having a meeting with his people down at Churchill Farms, and he said, listen, if we kill Bobby Kennedy, like Hoffa wants to do, it's, you know, everyone's going to know in two seconds who did it, because Bob Kennedy was so relentless on the mafia. He said, we're going to have to kill the guy who controls Bob Kennedy. We're going to have to kill the president. And he said, According to a source in the room who gave this information to the FBI a year before the murder, he said that I've got a nut who can handle the job. And then, and, and then and it's also that month, Santo Traficani, the boss of Tampa, was having a conversation with a, a, a Cuban businessman named Jose Aleman. And during their conversation where they were talking about the 64, they were talking about a Teamster pension fund loan, which, which Hoff had personally approved for Aleman, uh, they – they were discussing also the 1964 uh, presidential election. And Aleman says Kennedy's probably going to be reelected. And Traficani replies very ominously, no, Jose, he's going to be hit. And Hoff is making the arrangements for the murder. Now, Rob mentioned uh, Frank Regano. Frank Regano was the attorney for Jimmy Hoffa during his Chicago pension fraud case in 64. He was the attorney for Santo Traficani. He was the main attorney for Santo Traficani, and he also represented Carlos Marcello. Frank told me, and he wrote in his book later, that Hoffa had asked him to, that he wanted, um, he wanted the president dead and that, they, uh, that Frank Grigano carried the message to Marcello and Traficanti personally. And um, so 
we have a situation where you know it's 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 not considered in good taste to be uh, considering that this is a conspiracy. But once again, if Alan Dulles had said while he was a member of the Warren Commission, gentlemen, while I was CIA director, we um, at my direction and with my approval. Uh, we worked with the mafia to kill Fidel Castro. That would have created a whole new av- avenue of investigation, and we would be in a completely different place right now. And let's not forget the uh, mob helping getting Kennedy elected in 1960 in the first place. So that was well, going to be. I, 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 don't, I don't believe that for yeah. a second. Uh, that's mafia garbage that's been put out. That's mafia disinformation that's been put out. There is no way that the mafia, the guys who who bought the Kennedy brothers at the Senate Rackets Committee from 57 to 60, who are eating the, the mafia guys for breakfast, there's no way they're going to turn around in 1960 and support the Kennedy brothers. No way, shape, or form. Now, they may have tried to blackmail John Kennedy because John Kennedy was banging a woman who was also having an affair with Sam Giancana, that's possible, but that was a clear effort to blackmail the White House. There is no way that the mafia, in any way, shape, or form, supported John Kennedy over Richard Nixon during the 1960 presidential election. No way. There is some evidence, though, in the Frank Sinatra books to the contrary, though, Dan. <laughs> Frank Sinatra books. Please give me a give me a good source here. It was Frank Sinatra who introduced John Kennedy to the woman. Judith Campbell was her name. Mm-hmm. She was the one who was also having an affair with Sam Giancana. You know, again, it, it, it's it's garbage. You look at legitimate historians talking about this. There is no way that the mafia, especially they said, oh, they helped the win in Chicago with with Richard Daley as mayor of Chicago. They didn't need the mafia in order for a Democrat to win. The Democratic, the 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 general election in Chicago. No hey, way. Let's this get is, this is all mafia garbage. Let, before we run out of time, let's get to Jimmy Hoffa. Yeah. All right, uh, Jimmy Hoffa. You know, I'm I've been I am Ahab, and the Jimmy Hoffa case is my white whale, and uh, I've been looking for him for now what 48 years, I guess it is. We've come very close. We had a setback last year when the FBI got a search warrant for a place that I had identified based on my source. It's a very, very long story as to how this all came about. Um, it started in 1975. I had been investigating the Teamsters and the Mafia since I was in graduate school at Kent State in Ohio in uh, December 1974. And uh, I had done an eight-part series for a little newspaper. Uh, you know, The great investigative journalist John Quitney of the Wall Street Journal asked me to do some research for him for a three-part series that he was doing for, the, for his newspaper. His st- series came out on July 22nd, 23rd, and 24th of 1975. Uh, one week later, after John's series came out, Hoffa disappeared on July 30th, 1975. At, uh, I hit the ground running. I was, I was, because I had eight months under my belt of this, I went. I was hired by NBC News. I worked with them for a couple of months, and then I was with the Detroit Free Press and later with Jack Anderson. Uh, but the Hoffa case in, in, in specifically was a three-act drama with different characters in each act. Act one, Hoffa goes to the Red Fox restaurant in Bloomfield Township, Michigan, uh, waiting to meet uh, three people. Tony Provenzano, a labor racketeer out of New Jersey, Tony Giacalone, a street boss in Detroit, uh, and um, Lenny Lenny Schultz, who's a uh, Giacalone-connected businessman in Detroit. And um, supposedly none of these guys showed up. In Act 2, Hoffa is being picked up by somebody. I, I believe it's Vito Giacalone, Tony Giacalone's brother. I was told that by a, a mob guy who was implicated in the Hoffa murder. The guy's name was Phil Moscato, which is also a long story. Uh, in Act 2, Hoffa is taken to a location, and there he's murdered by a guy named Sal Bergulio. Sal Bergulio was a top lieutenant to Tony Provenzano, one of the guys Hoffa was supposed to meet. According to the informant who received this information, a guy named Ralph Picardo, who was in prison for manslaughter and was a member of the Provenzano crew and had received this information from one of the alleged co-conspirators during a prison visitation about a week after Hoffa was murdered. Hoffa was then, after his murder, he was stuffed into a 55-gallon drum, loaded onto a gateway transportation truck, and shipped to New Jersey where he was buried in Brother Moscato's dump, the Phil Moscato, who was a soldier in the Vito Genovese crime family. 
The FBI uh, brought all these guys before the grand jury. They did a search warrant at the dump, but they didn't know where to look. And then years later, I, I was investigating a crooked judge down in Florida. The judge was getting payments from the mafia. The mafia guy making the payments was Phil Moscato. I called Phil Moscato up in New Jersey, and I said, hey, you know, I'd like to talk to you about these payoffs to this, this, this federal judge. And he said, well, come on up. So I went up there. I started asking about the federal judge with the tape recorder on. And then I said to him, Listen, I, we know each other from the Hoffa case. He goes, you wrote that book in 78. And I said, yeah. And I said, so tell me what happened. He was the one who told me that in Act 1, it was Vito Giacalone who picked up Hoffa. In Act 2, it was Sal Bergoglio who killed Hoffa. And in Act 3, the body is buried at his dump. But he didn't seem to know where. So after my years with him, I spent seven years interviewing him, during which time, for the most part, he gave me information with the frequency that a kosher butcher sells pork chops. He <laughs> then um, gave – I then, uh, after he died, his partner's son contacted me, Paul Coppola. And Paul Coppola, who was, who was uh, Phil Moscato's partner at Brother Moscato's Stump, the official name was PJP Landfill, this, 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 this scary uh, dump in, uh, under the Pulaski Skyway in Jersey City, a place where there's rats, wild dogs, quicksand, and everything else. It was hell on earth over there. It was a target of an EPA Superfund. It was a Superfund site. And so um, the, the son, Frank Coppola, we met – we went down there, and he showed me this alcove under the bridge. He said, this is where my father buried Hoffa. And so we did – I had originally did a um, – I had invited uh, Fox News to come along with me for our, our first GPR. Um, they made the arrangement for the GPR guy. They paid for it and everything else. We went down there. They detected something, these barrels. Hoffa was buried in a barrel. And then there were barrels placed on top of them. So we weren't looking for just one barrel. We were looking for a sheet of metal. And, um, and so uh, Fox detected something, and, uh, but it turned out not to be anything of any importance. But we had another GPR at another location, and that spot was untouched when the FBI got its search warrant last June. Uh, a year ago, and and said, uh, you know, we had searched down there, we had dug with excavators, and didn't find anything. I said, you didn't search in the one place that we gave you, you know. I've got film of what's going on down there, and you guys didn't even put a shovel in it, let alone an excavator. And so we're waiting. Uh, I've been trying diplomatically for the past year to try to get them to go back, and it's not like my team, had, they have to fly them in from California. They are right there 15 minutes from the site. The, the, the field office of the FBI in Newark is 10 minutes away from the site. They could do this in their lunch hour and get this thing settled once and for all. I mean, the, I'm basing this, what my information is based on, the Ralph Picardo lead, which the FBI did in 1975. I'm playing off a lead that the FBI had developed in 1975. The FBI deserves tremendous credit for this, but I want a very generous assist for what I've done in this, and I want this second bite of the apple, and I'm not giving up until I get it. Um, and so, uh, once again, I am Ahab, and Hoffa is my white whale. Hoffa, he is, he is findable, and we are going to find him one way or another. That's fascinating. Now, there, th what is the true reason for Hoffa's murder? Hoffa, was, <laughs> Hoffa had been um, pardoned with a proviso. He, he had received a commutation on his, uh, on his prison sentence. In, um, in, in December 1971 by, by President uh, Nixon, there was a proviso on that restriction saying that he could not seek union office until 1980. Hoffa, when he was released, and he had a real hard time in prison, where he had had a fight with Tony Provenzano, one of the guys he was supposed to be meeting on the day he was murdered, and whose men were the ones who killed him. Um, it was um, he tried to he tried to get this the yoke of this 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 restriction that he could not seek union office uh, lifted. He tr he was trying to do it legally and everything else. He wasn't able to do it. He started getting very paranoid. He believed everybody surrounding him was was double crossing him. And so, during the final months of his life, he was talking to reporters, congressional committees, Senate committee, um, grand juries. He was talking, and I think that in in that in that final day, it was the act was made in order to silence him. All right, we've got a prosecuting attorney in the room here, and Matt Harvey, 
Matt, Hi, what, Matt. Do you, what do you got for me? Wow. Uh, I don't know where to start. Um, <laughs> except, so you've spent a, a considerable amount of your life studying conspiracy theories and writing about them. And well, I think you agree, Matt, as a prosecutor, that any reasonable definition of organized crime has to be that it is conspiracy crime. Uh, crime by association. So as a, those of us who investigate organized crime, as I'm sure you do, we investigate conspiracies. But go ahead. That's right. And, and, and what I mean by that is putting together pieces of a puzzle um, to, True. to come to a conclusion. Is there anything currently happening in society that it kind of is piquing your interest that might be something that's going on that the public is unaware of? or misled about? Gee, <laughs> wow, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, I would say tons of things. There, there are tons of things that are that are out there. Uh, well, which one again, interests we, you the most? Well, right now, you know, this Bobby Kennedy Jr., um, you know, running for president thing where he's out there embracing conspiracy theories beyond his anti-vax campaign where he's talking about his father was not murdered by Sirhan Sirhan, a man who was not only convicted of the murder, but a man who has repeatedly confessed to the murder. And that he's saying that a guy named Gene Caesar, Thane Eugene Caesar, was the actual murderer of his father. I mean, you know, I have Gene Caesar's power of attorney. I spent a ton of time with Gene Caesar when I thought that he had done it. I, I, I couldn't, because there were so many contradictions in his story, I didn't know how much time and money I had to spend on this guy. So I went to a federal prosecutor friend of mine out in Los Angeles, a guy named Marvin Rudnick, who was a strike force guy. And he, I said, Marvin, what do I do? Uh, I, do I polygraph the guy? Do I hypnotize the guy? He's agreed to both. And he says, well, if you hypnotize him, it's going to be tantamount to tampering with a witness. I suggest that you polygraph him. So I found the best polygraph operator I could find out in Los Angeles, a guy named Ed Gelb, who was president of the American Polygraph Association. And I said, can you do this? And he was very excited about it. When he saw the evidence and everything else, he was very excited about it. And he said, if one of my associates do it, it's going to cost you 400 If I do it, it's going to cost you 4000 I said, I want you to do it. I want it to be believed. I want, it to, uh, I want it to be done right. And so Gelb, thinking that this guy may have been involved in a conspiracy, uh, did the polygraph, and he came out, um, you know, about two, three hours later. You know how long the polygraph takes, Matt. And, um, and he said, this guy is innocent. This guy has passed with flank. He had a plus 26 or something like that. And it was uh, no doubt about it in the world. This guy was an innocent man, wrongly accused. That's when I turned my sights to Sirhan. And Sirhan, who actually was a very articulate, very nice guy and everything else, I, we, we sort of got along the first interview where I was sort of patting my hand saying, poor Sirhan, poor Sirhan, you're so, you're so misunderstood. And then I caught him in several lies, and then the second interview with him was a little more hostile. And then the third interview, both the New York Times and Newsweek described it as absolutely chilling, the interview between uh, Sirhan and me, where I really got on his ass. And he, I was, I was, the witness at all three uh, interviews was his brother, Adele Sirhan, who was one of the finest people I've ever known. And, um, and uh, it was just no doubt about it, uh, you know, coming out of it. Sirhan did it, and he did it alone. There's no answers or buts about it. And I just can't believe that Bobby Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy Jr. called me. He called me after he had interviewed Sirhan. He spent two, three hours with Sirhan. And he called me to tell me about it. He says, I don't think he did it. And I said, Bobby, this is the guy who killed your dad. And he doesn't get that. He, he doesn't get that. He is absolutely convinced, 100% convinced, that the CIA killed his father and that, uh, and that Sirhan, Sirhan went in there uh, and, did not, and, and, and basically was not the person who killed his father, that it was this fellow named Gene Caesar, this security guard who you know, passed the polygraph test. He died in, in 2019. In fact, as soon as I announced that he had died, Bobby Kennedy uh, came out on Instagram and, and flat out accused uh, Gene Caesar of being the murderer and, and, and accused me, personally, me, Dan Muldea, of demanding $25,000, which sabotaged his noble efforts to, uh, to talk to the, to interview the man who killed his father, which is a total and complete lie. In fact, I'm dealing with this right now. But um, uh, once again, I think that's one thing that needs to be straightened out. The Washington Post really got behind Bobby Kennedy Jr. when he made these crazy claims. And, um, 
and I've been begging the New York Times to, uh, to, to clean up the mess that the Washington Post has created with its love affair with Bobby Kennedy Jr. and his ridiculous conspiracy theory about his father's death. Dan, thank you for not dropping any F-bombs there in that discussion. <laughs> appreciate the self-editing there. Hey, uh, real quick, we're just about out of time. Um, we're going to plug the book, but I, I got a quick question from one of our listeners. I noticed it on your resume as well. You were at Kent State matching the same time frame that Jack Lambert was there. Did your paths cross? Uh, no, Jack was, I think, uh, I was, I was uh, undergraduate at the University of Akron, which is about 10 miles to the west of Kent, and I was student body president there. And then when I graduated, I, I went to graduate school at Kent State. Jack, I think, graduated in 72 from Kent, and no, I've never met him. Yeah, he, I've never met him. He was 74. And I never met Thurman Munson either, who was, <laughs> who was another Kent State grad. Yeah. All right, uh, John Gilstrap, hold up the book. Here it is, Confessions of a Guerrilla Writer, um, in its third edition at this point. I'm telling you, it's it's it reads like like butter. It it really and everything it, everything I just told you is in the book. So, thank, thank you, gentlemen, and, for and even more, <laughs> David. Always a pleasure. You shouldn't talk so much, but I love you. I, I, I'm sorry for horning in on you like that. <laughs> Dan, great stuff. Appreciate it, man. Pleasure, my friends. Thank you. Take care.